our experience that uh, online teaching and learning or we're all working online. Um, so yeah, welcome. So today we're launching a new edition of Paul Bennett's book, um, Clinical Psychology Research and Practice. Uh, my name is Bryony, I'm responsible for marketing the book and I'm absolutely delighted that you're all able to join us today. Um, so you're obviously here, if you can see us, hopefully you can also hear us. Um, if you can't, then do make sure you're connected properly. Um, if you're connected to any apps that use a lot of um, connectivity, such as Netflix or YouTube or gaming, you might want to just turn those off just to get the best experience. And you will hopefully have just seen a little message pop up letting you know that the event is being recorded. Um, so we are recording it today and we will be sharing it um, with everybody who's registered. There'll be a few people that have registered that won't have been able to make it. Um, but also do feel free to share this with anybody else you know who might find it useful. Um, and we'll be popping the link on our sort of social media channels and, and similar too. Okay, um, so um, obviously we are the only people that can uh, officially speak um, at the session um, are those on the panel, but if you would like to put questions to Paul, please do, we would love you to engage in that way. Um, you can use the Q&A box for this, um, and Clara will be putting those questions um, to Paul at the end of the event. Um, you should also be able to hopefully upvote other people's questions, so if you see something you'd really like to know the answer to, um, then do flag that and that should bring those to the top. Um, and we've also got the chat box, of course, just for general chat and queries. So uh, do make use of that too. Um, I've put here the cover of the book in case you aren't aware what we're talking about. Um, so this is a brand new edition published this month of Paul's brand new book. Um, and I am going to hand over now to my colleague, Clara, who's going to do um, some introductions for you. Um, Clara is our commissioning editor for our psychology list and will be interviewing Paul for you. Thanks, Clara. Hi, thanks, Bryony. Um, so I was just going to start by introducing Paul. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be here with Paul today. He's one of Open University Press's best-selling authors. He brings a huge range of expertise to his writing. Currently, he's Professor of Clinical and Health Psychology at Swansea University, and previously he's worked at both Cardiff and Bristol. In total, he's been teaching students about clinical psychology for over 20 years. Some of the nuance of Paul's Broad and comprehensive coverage of mental illness and mental health care comes from his work in the related field of health psychology as well. Um, and Paul was previously chair-elect of the BPS Division of Health Psychology. He's also worked as a practitioner, um, as a clinical psychologist in the NHS, specialising in adult mental health, including working with younger and older adults for over 10 years. Um, and as a practitioner, a few of Paul's most notable roles include being head of Swansea Psychotherapy Services, and head of Bristol Clinical Health Psychology Services. Um, another string to Paul's bow is his modesty. Um, so I think it's probably best I stop talking about him now um, and start talking to him. So hi, Paul. Hello, Clara. Always good to be reminded of your age at this point. <laughs> yeah, I deliberately put in those lengths of time there and I'll let anyone who wants to add up how much that cumulatively, that career experience um, adds up to. Um, so to start off, um, I wanted to flag, so this is the fourth edition of this book, um, and it's been a student staple for close to 20 years now, with the first edition coming out in 2003. The previous editions were all titled Abnormal and Clinical Psychology, and we've taken the unusual step of retitling this book at the fourth edition. So we've dropped the term abnormal and gone for simply clinical psychology, research and practice. Can you talk a little bit about why this title change was important to you? Yes, of course. Um, you'll notice I've got the interrogation lamp on top of me just to make me feel... <laughs> exactly. That's, that's what I was hoping for. <laughs> yeah, I think the change is really important because, you know, men, the, the terminology used in mental health uh, has changed a lot over the years. Um, there's been a movement to destigmatize, um, remove stereotypes of mental health. And the word abnormal has quite a few connotations. It's sort of implies that there are people that are normal and there are these strange abnormal people with uh, mental health problems which is clearly untrue i mean you know a significant proportion of the population will experience uh, mental health uh, problems over their lifetime and you know it, i think it's better to think of it as a continuum of sort of mental health experiences rather than a dichotomy of you are okay or you are not okay to quote a famous book from some years ago <laughs> Yeah, that, that's why I was really keen to get rid of that word and sort of remove some of those negative connotations and sort of move into the 21st century, so to speak. Yeah, and it was it was nice from a publisher point of view. Um, obviously, we feel the same way and we're keen to do that. 
anyway, um, but it's been really great to see that that change is being reflected um, across the board. So increasing number of courses won't use the word abnormal anymore, um, other books and websites in the field. Um, so that's a change that's happened since the last edition that we're excited to see and excited to be able to, to replicate. Um, so we've discussed one thing that's changed about the book and we will loop back to the others. Um, but for now, I wanted to ask you about some of the things that have stayed the same, um, namely the writing style. So you've been widely praised for the clarity with which you write, with the word accessibility being another recurring term across all of the book reviews we have so far. Um, so we have a student review here, which I just wanted to read out. Um, the tone of this volume is well pitched. It's written in clear English, yet without being oversimplified. New vocabulary is collated into key terms boxes for easy reference at the end of the chapter. And an instructor review, the writing style and pedagogy are ideal for my students, second and third year undergraduates. There are obviously other texts on the market, but this particular one seems to be written specifically for undergraduate students and does not try to be too clever. Mm -hmm. You've also taught undergraduates clinical psychology for over 20 years. Um, and one of the things that I see as an editor is that often the best teachers are the best writers as they have a really good working understanding of which content areas students struggle with, as well as just how to communicate with students without patronizing them. Um, I guess my question is, to what extent do you think your teaching has helped you in your writing? I think a lot. I mean, I, I, it's interesting because um, I, I really do um, work hard at getting things clear. So for example, there's one of the theories that I talk about is Wells SREF self-regulatory framework. And it's quite a complex model if you actually look at it in, in detail. And I have to say, I spent a lot of time trying to get that described in a simple way so that I could read it and come back and um, really get a, get a feel for clarity. And years ago when I was a student, I remember um, one of my uh, lecturers said that one of my one of my uh, essays was particularly good, says he, bragging slightly. <laughs> it, there was no bullshit in there. It was just clear, it was well written, and there wasn't an attempt to sort of flannel around the ideas or issues that I wasn't clear on. And clearly I've always remembered that. It was one of the few bits of praise I got as an undergraduate, so it's clearly there. But it really has framed how I think about communication. Um, so yeah, I spend a lot of time trying to work and obviously we talk to students, we get feedback from them about lectures, issues, and my lectures are obviously based around some of the um, um, chapters in the book. So I get feedback on clarity and so on and so forth. So yeah, I, I really work, it is an issue that I work very hard on trying to do that and with feedback from students and so forth. I think it's something that fits really well with the ethos of Open University Press of the ability to share complex findings from academia but without using complex language and having that mission of accessibility so it has been a real pleasure to work on this book um, and it's it's nice to hear you pick up on those elements for yourself and recognize um, how successful you are at doing that um, so continuing on the theme of writing style um, one of the other elements of the book that has been widely picked up on is your ability to successfully maintain a neutral tone um, so I have another review from Dr. Jessica Fielding at Bristol, um, which I'll read here. This text offers comprehensive coverage without explicitly favoring one approach as a catch-all for different types of clinical psychology. This allows the reader to formulate their own perspective and also use this text to then guide further reading. So my question is, why do you think that having a neutral tone is important in an introductory text? And you cover some quite controversial issues in the book. Were there any areas where you were particularly tempted to break your neutral tone? <laughs> I, I, yeah, one of the arguments about health um, psychotherapists in the health service, people that do therapy, mm -hmm. is that um, why do clinical psychologists, why should you, as, as I was, be the sort of dominant profession? Why should you be the lead profession in this? And I think. Part of the reason for that is it is multi-theoretical, multi-therapeutic approach. So the idea is that you work with the best and the optimal intervention for, for the person that you're working with rather than necessarily have a dominant paradigm. CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, clearly is the dominant uh, uh, paradigm, but people use others. We use systemic therapy. And I remember many years ago, there was the head of a, 
uh, when I was working in Bristol, the head of the uh, Bristol uh, Psychology Service was an ardent behaviorist. Um, there became this rumor that he'd actually been using psychotherapy, psychoanalytic um, issues in his in the form of therapy that he was working with. And it was like, oh, my goodness me, Dougal Mackay was called. And there was a real tremor went through uh, the <laughs> therapy population. Oh, my goodness me. But I honestly think that that's part of why psychology, clinical psychology is powerful, because it doesn't stick to one paradigm or one approach. And you know, to sort of label some as less good than others or less appropriate than others, I think would be problematic. And in fact, if you look at the history of psychoanalysis, for example, it's quite interesting because in the early days of psychoanalysis, you know, it was the dominant paradigm. And then in the 1980s, there were a number of meta-analyses that were done looking at the effectiveness of um, various types of intervention. And at that time, psychoanalysis was clearly bottom of the pile. It was seen as as effective, if slightly less effective than placebo. You know, so it's very easy to sort of say that this is. But actually, more recent models of uh, psychoanalytic therapy are now proving quite effective, you know, maybe equally effective to CBT or some of the dominant sort of paradigms. So to, you know, not give equal weighting to you know, either historically important approaches or increasingly useful approaches, I think will be quite wrong. Um, so I really do strive to give equal weighting, equal sort of responsibility, if you like, to all these different approaches and different models of how people arrive at mental health problems. Uh, In terms of my bias, oh, go on, were you going to say something, Clara? No, I think I was going to prompt you to say exactly what you're about to say. Was there a moment when you really, really didn't want to be neutral? <laughs> I think one of my, yeah, I mean, one of my big issues, I think, is what is therapy all about and why do we do psychotherapy? And how much should we focus on the individual? And how much should we focus on the context in, in which the individual is, is, is situated? Mm. And I've worked in public health. I've worked on health promotion for physical health as, uh, rather than mental health. But I, I think the environment, the social context, and if you look at the fairly turbulent times in the last few months when this book was being written, you know, we had Black Lives Matter. We had, you know, the sort of issues happening over in America. I'm not going to get too political here, um, but you may you're, have you're predicting my next feelings. question. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you know, you know, if you look, for example, at sort of uh, socioeconomic deprivation, if you look at ethnicity, particularly in America, where these things may be starker, but it's the same here. You know, the rates of mental health for the poor, for, for black populations are much higher than they are for the less, you know, better well off um, other populations. So you have to start thinking about how do you work? How do you improve the mental well-being of people that are living in difficult circumstances? And it may not, the optimum may not be one-to-one -one therapy. So yeah. I, 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 I really do feel that those are the sort of things we tend to neglect in these books, which is why there is a chapter on this. Um, yeah. Because I think those sorts of things we should be addressing as much as one-to-one -one therapy. Clara, I can see you're really keen to get in there, so I should shut up. No, I, please, please finish. <laughs> oh, I had finished. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, no, I mean, all, all I was going to say, just kind of as a follow-up to that, is I'm just interested to hear you talk about what role you think one-on-one -on -one therapy can have in improving people's lives and where, where you think it's been overblown or where you think if not one-on-one -on -one therapy where else can we be looking that could significantly impact mental health at a population level I, 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 yeah it's interesting and thank you because it's allowing me to expand on this i think if you look at rates of mental health across the population there are clearly there are clear demographics where mental health problems are the prevalence of uh, such problems are higher than others but nevertheless within those populations, there is a distribution of mental health. Some people are mentally well, some people are mentally healthy, some people are experiencing difficulties. So there isn't a one-to-one -one relationship between um, socioeconomic, ethnic, gender issues and mental health. 
there is a sort of moderating impact of how well the individual copes with the things that they're experiencing, whether they're rich, poor, black, white, or whatever. So I think, you know, there is clearly a role for, for psychotherapy. I'm not trying to suggest that there isn't. And that, that will help people manage life circumstances, broader issues that they're having to deal with. So I think, you know, there is clearly a role, a central role for individual work or group work with people with mental health problems. But I think also, I remember when I was working as a clinical psychologist, uh, there was a, a the in-house magazine at the time, I think it was called Clinical Psychology Forum. And um, somebody wrote into that and said, well, every week I do four days of one-to-one -one therapy. And on the fifth day, it sounds slightly biblical here, but on the fifth day, <laughs> do I, I lobby I, I get in touch with parliaments I get in touch with local politicians about mental health issues and I think that's quite a nice model that part of what we clearly need to be doing as a clinical psychologist is one-to-one -one therapy helping people manage improve the, the quality of their life um, but there may be some time that we may be thinking about these wider issues uh, and trying to influence uh, the people that um are going to influence us even if local government wider government health service mm. etc cetera, et cetera. it's it's a hard balance to strike and i think it's something that you you do successfully cover of championing therapy and how that can help the individual to live in the world that we all live in you know giving people skills to cope with the situation that they're in but equally not normalizing some of the situations that people find themselves in because you don't want to say the problem is you you need to work on yourself when perhaps some of the biggest triggers that we know for mental health problems are things like poverty um and i think you put that across so well um that you have that real ability to kind of toe the line between giving students the skills that they need to be able to deliver this kind of um intervention and understand it but also to let them kind of push push beyond that and, and get that kind of breadth when they're thinking about these things. Um, so kind of leading on from that, I suppose my next question, um, so you've, you've touched on that chapter um, about these issues, which is called Beyond the Individual. Um, so I wanted to kind of draw out a few themes from that. Um, so you, you cover some of the sociological predictors of mental illness, for example, women being more likely to be diagnosed with depression, anxiety, and somatic complaints, while men are more likely to be diagnosed with alcohol dependence and antisocial personality disorder. Um, a quote from your book I was quite moved by is about gender. Um, so the WHO identified a number of gender specific factors that particularly influence risk of experiencing mental illness for women, including gender-based violence, socioeconomic disadvantage, low income and income inequality, an unremitting responsibility for the care of others. Mm. So I suppose my question really for you is, why do you think it's important to consider this material at undergraduate level? Because there will be people that think, no, you know, walk before you can run, cover what the models are, something, um, you know, those more complex um, grounding of what's happening in the world, that the world that the people who are mentally ill live in, that's going to confuse undergraduates, they're new to the topic, leave that out, but you feel strongly and I think have managed to successfully, you wanted to integrate this in, with, into the book. Why, why do you think that's important at this level when you are dealing with, with undergraduates, some of whom are first years? Well, you don't have to read the chapter, of course, but I, I think, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think one of, one of the um, things that, um, discriminates between the therapies and perhaps the medical model is the formulation the idea of what leads the individual to be experiencing the problems that they're experiencing and some of those are going to be in the life course some of those are going to be day-to-day um, -day experiences that, that are sort of maintaining a problem and so forth and I think you know to to not look at those external factors that are going to influence people's experiences um i don't know i think it's a real weakness and i think you know i think undergraduates can take a nice psychological model and sort of look at that because what we tend to do is look at the internal processes what is happening in the individual um but i think it really i think it does help them to gain a better understanding of why some people may experience these things and if you take a formulation process 
in some ways, what we do is look at all these external factors and then look at the internal processes that make them into being a sort of mental health issue. Um, so, for example, you know, if you have this unrelenting, you know, caring, then, you know, what does that do to your levels of exhaustion? What does that do to the way you think about the world? You know, how does it leave you being an effective coper? All these things are impacting through psychological processes. So this is never to say that the psychology is unimportant, but these are genuine issues that are impacting on people. And I, I think, you know, I think we need to get people to think slightly more holistically. I see that was in your description of yourself in terms of publication, but holistically about what are the processes that, that are leading to these people. Just to say, oh, you have a strange way of thinking about the world. You know, you have you know, the, the sort of Beckian idea that we have cognitive distortions. Um, yes, they may be contributing, but what if some of those distortions that life is difficult, life doesn't have many opportunities are actually true and not distortions? So mm. I think we have to look at that other side as well. Mm. And I think something you and I talked about when we were putting the book together and thinking, you know, what what level of this is, is appropriate um, was the fact that students live in the same world that we do. Um, I think sometimes that that does get missed out when we're thinking about undergraduate students. You know, it's it's not um, it's not always the case that they're looking at this from a cold abstract perspective. You know, there will be people who study on these modules who themselves have experiences of mental illness, who may have caring responsibilities, who may have been through trauma. Um, so far from, you know, introducing that material necessarily being a shock to them, there are some students for whom I imagine that that will be validating. Absolutely. I mean, I live in the South Wales Valleys, um, and if you want urban, if you want rural deprivation, or um, then Merthyr Tydfil, which is five miles away from me, um, yeah. is a real good example of that. And there you have high levels of unemployment, high levels of drug use that go along with that, high levels of unemployment, high levels of mental health problems that people are experiencing and they're, they're, these things are intimately intertwined and to sort of disregard some of those external factors and just assume that we we get into drugs because hey they're fun or whatever or we have <laughs> mental health issues mental health problems that are independent some of those those pressures that people are living under you know to me is just missing out a fundamental element and you know anybody coming from the welsh valleys that doesn't see those sorts of descriptors and those sorts of issues i think would say what's missing from the book rather than why mm. is it there and you know not just wales obviously but elsewhere mm -hmm. so thinking about how you've done that like how you've you've interwoven that more complex and societal coverage with um, that kind of basic understanding of what the different clinical models are. Um, so partly how you have done that to answer, the, my, to answer my own question, what I wanted to say was you've introduced these brilliant stop and think boxes throughout the book um, where you ask questions that kind of gently guide the reader um, towards thinking beyond the curriculum. Um, and you have a range of really interesting discussion questions, a lot of which are quite challenging. Um, and since you are asking students to consider these questions, I thought I would put you on the spot um, and ask some of your own questions. Okay. Um, <laughs> back to you. Um, so I'm quoting from the book here. At the time of writing this book, there are protests across America, the UK, and many other countries as a response to institutional racism, frequently focusing on the way ethnic minorities have been treated by the police. Sparked by the death of George Floyd, the US protests have become a bitter, literal battleground between races and people of differing socio-political views. The response of the US president has been sent in the National Guard and others to firstly attempt to quell the protests and then to arrest people with their only offense being the pursuit of lawful protest. How should local and national government respond to what may be considered decades of discriminative practices against whole communities? Consider how you could promote mental health within the wider population or specific groups, such as those who are directly affected by the Black Lives Matter protests. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I just think if you're going to throw it out to others, you have to be ready to have it thrown back to you. <laughs> well, in a way, far be it from me to speak for these communities. And I think um, what one of the, when I worked in public health, one of the 
Um, there, are, there are various public health models about how to intervene in, um, at a public health at a population level, one of which is called uh, the precede seed proceed model. You precede your intervention and then you proceed on getting, getting along with it. And the precede focus is really going to the populations and finding out what are the issues, what do they want. So rather than, you know, some external politician expert coming along and saying this is what you need um really the the the, the the you know the answers to some of these questions lie in the groups that are being affected by these issues and so what i what i would do would be to go into those groups hold some um, focus groups individual meetings preferably led by people from the community rather than some external person that may not be resonating to some of the issues that they have and looking at the solutions that, that, that they want. Um, just to sort of narrow it down, I worked um, in occupational health at one time. I was working at looking at um, organizational stress in Bristol, in fact. Where, and uh, I think when they employed me, I think the idea was that I would sort of do psychotherapy to relieve the stress of some of the people working there. But what we actually did was to run some focus groups um, to try and find out in each of the different groups, you know, porters, cleaners, nurses, medics, et cetera, what were the stresses that they were experiencing and what were their potential solutions? And that's always struck me as really powerful because I just remember one of, when, when I interviewed one of the nurse, the nurse managers, um, I was told, oh, she's really good. You need to talk to her. She's great. And, you know, one of the issues that she discovered was that at the handover between the night staff and, and the day staff, um, you know, people were getting stressed because they were rushing in. They were, some of them were late. She talked to the nurses and it turned out that some of them were dropping their kids off on the way to work. And if the traffic was good, then they got there on time. If the traffic was bad, they didn't. So she just moved the, the handover a quarter of an hour later and recorded it. A really simple sort of solution that I would never have thought of. So I think, you know, what we need to do is to get in there and find out uh, and talk to people and find out what, and, and then draw out some sort of doable things in the long term, short term, mm -hmm. things that may not be able to change and then develop a strategy of change. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, that kind of collaborative approach. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I suppose kind of moving on from that, just because I want to make sure that we, we cover this. Um, so the book is fully updated to the, the new DSM, the DSM-5, um, the Diagnostic and Statistics Manual, just in case we have anyone who's coming from outside the field. Um, would you like to talk about some of the specific updates of this DSM um, and also more generally what you see the shift being between the last DSM and, and this DSM and what effect you think that is going to have on the way that we're viewing mental health treatment. Sure. I mean, I think one of the things that I raised quite early on is how useful DSM-5 actually is. I mean, there's quite a lot of controversy about it because some people have argued that it's sort of expanding the remit of uh, mental health to include, or mental illness, as it may be called in DSM, to include, you know, quite normal experiences. So if you're bereaved, um, this is now uh, given a sort of diagnostic label. And some people have argued that the criteria for anxiety are now so wide that most people or significant proportion of the population would actually fit within that remit. So, um, you know, the DSM, as always brings a degree of controversy because it is an opinion um, you know, of a select group of psychiatrists about what fits and what doesn't fit. It's not theoretically driven. It is based on their clinical, if you like, now. So I think for a book about clinical psychology, the whole issue of DSM is quite interesting because um, I remember when I worked as a clinical psychologist, every month I'd have to fill in the, you know, the, you know, how many patients, as they were then called, I'd seen with different diagnostic labels and I'd struggle like mad. It's like, mm, is this, is this, does this fit with yeah. that? Whatever. Because essentially, you know, what I really work on is, is trying to get 
the readers, the students to think more in terms of the formulation. What are the processes that led? What are the experiences that the person's having? So, you know, DSM-5 may be happy to say, you know, uh, one of the criteria for schizophrenia is having hallucinations. But as a, as a psychologist, that actually doesn't tell you very much. What you need to know is the nature of them, you know, the consequences of them, when they occur and so on and so forth. Mm. So, you know, DSM, I think we can't do without DSM. We need these broad labels, but what DSM does is allow you to sort of categorize into broad um, types of problems, you know, anxiety, depression, addiction, etc. But within those, what I really try and emphasize is the fact that, you know, it, there are processes within those. So we've got formulation boxes that talk about, you know, cases and look at the, 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 um, the processes that lead between childhood events and subsequent mental health problems. Um, you know, ongoing events that may impact on those. So I think DSM has a role. Um, you know, we need those broad categories. But I think if you want to be psychologically sophisticated, you need to be thinking about things in terms of these formulations and sort of process models, which I, I, I try and emphasize within that broader approach. Mm -hmm. I've now rambled and forgotten. I'm sure there were other elements to the question. I think I think you covered it. Um, I guess to maybe summarise um, for people who aren't familiar with the previous DSM and with this DSM, would it be fair to say, in your opinion, that we're looking at an increasing medicalization of mental health problems? Far be it from me to say, but many would say that. I shall leave it. <laughs> Real politician's answer there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll allow it um, because I have other things that I want to cover. Um, so I wanted to um, kind of pivot from there and talk about um, some of the additional resources that we put together for this book. Um, so as a few people might know, um, we've built an online learning companion, um, or to use a common phrase, a website for the book, um, and it has two different sections. So I was just gonna talk a little about what's in each and then ask you a few questions about it. Um, so for instructors, instructors, we have detailed lecture suggestions demonstrating how you can best use the book's content in your teaching, balancing covering the core curriculum with ensuring students have a deeper understanding of the issues at play, suggested classroom activities that map to each chapter, including suggested topics for small group discussions, short exercises, um, all designed to help consolidate understanding and more. And we also have ready-made PowerPoints um, for easy integration into your teaching. Um, so if you are teaching using this book, um, you don't have to make your own PowerPoint. We have PowerPoint ready to go for you that you can download. Um, and then for students, we have a document for every chapter with links to external places where you can see the issues that are discussed within those chapters brought to life. Um, and that includes references to TED Talks, um, to popular films like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and Girl Interrupted, and a whole range of YouTube videos, including taped examples of therapy sessions, and also things like personal vlogs from people who have lived experiences of some of the disorders that were covered. Um, and we also have sample essay questions where you can see examples of the kind of material that you would need to draw on if you were being asked that question and, and how best to use the book. Um, so I guess in terms of a question that I have for you, um, you've included quite a range of things, as I've said, films, YouTube videos. Why do you think it's important to provide links to all those other forms of media as opposed to just the textbook itself? And, and what do you think the value is for student learning? Now, can I just say that this was the, is it the nadir, the low point of our relationship when you kept telling me, get that PowerPoint sorted or get this, oh dear Lord, <laughs> <laughs> we, we got through. Um, I, think I mean, I would say it was the low point where you kept not sending me the PowerPoints, but you know, it's okay, <laughs> <we'll> move on. <laughs> well, clearly these are real people. I mean, you know, you can only get so much, you know, from reading. Uh, and one of the dangers, and, and you do see it, is, you know, I do, uh, one of the exams that we now do is to get third year students to develop a formulation. And uh, so we give them a little case history, and then we ask them to come up with a formulation of the problem and then a treatment plan based on that treatment, uh, based on that formulation. 
And some students really excel with this. You know, they, they, they really inhabit the individual and develop a, a, a really good. But other students find this quite difficult to move from the abstract, you know, I'd much rather have a critically evaluate the evidence for dum dum type type lecture. Um, and, and I think in a way, we, if we're going to get people interested and engaged in, in mental health, clinical psychology, you know, we, I, I really want to get people to, to gain the experience of what it feels like to have those problems, to go through therapy, so that you're moving it from a sort of abstract, critically evaluate to a much more meaningful experience where you can bring in some of those experiences into your own thinking. Um, you know, I, I, you know, it is, it is a very different way of thinking. You know, and I, I think, you know, it is behoven on us. I, I genuinely think that we really, if we're going to talk about these really important issues, whether people want to do a clinical career or not, but these are things that are going to influence people through their life course. They're either going to get mental health problems, they're going to know people with mental health problems. So, you know, moving from the abstract to the personal, I think is really quite important. So, you know, when we look at the videos, some of them are patient, uh, videos. Some of them are therapist videos when they talk about how they do these things. Some of them are modeling the different therapeutic approaches. You know, the TED talks are usually from people that are experiencing problems and talking about their experiences and so forth. So what I try to do is to get a diverse, um, you know, set of um, videos and links, etc. Um, so that it wasn't just TED talks or just YouTube or whatever. Um, so yeah, I think it's really important, actually. And I, picking up on something you say yourself in the book, um, also particularly important um, for students who will go on to be clinicians, um, to look at that kind of material and understand that when they're dealing with another person, um, that person is rarely going to come and say in bullet points, like in a textbook, I am anxious. Um, my problem comes from my childhood when X. It, often people do present things in, in much more of a muddled way because they're experiencing distress it is more muddled and they don't necessarily come to you with that clarity that's something that as a clinician you provide to them and I think that's something that I didn't necessarily have clear in my head before I started working on this project with you how how much value there is for people who are training to be clinicians in watching other clinicians and seeing how those subtleties play out because um, ultimately a book can be hugely important in laying that framework um, but also it is important for it to direct people to where to go next um, so that they kind of start to develop that ability to know how to deal with these things in, in the real world. Um, so just before we move on, um, because I'm keen to get to some audience questions, um, in case we have anyone on the line who might be looking to use the website, um, I was just gonna share my screen really quickly um, and show you what it looks like. So, Cool, so this is our online learning center. Um, so if you're an instructor, you can go here and you can see for every chapter of the book, if you click, it's gonna download a PDF for you. Um, so here's an example. You can see learning objectives, a chapter outline, questions for discussion there, lecture suggestions, classroom activities, yeah, I'll spare you uh, just reading it out because um, I'd be keen for people to go and look for themselves later. But um, yep, and then if you go to PowerPoints, um, I won't click here because it'll take a second to download. I have already downloaded it. Um, but here's an example. So I picked obsessive compulsive disorder. We have here um, really helpful summaries of everything that you would need to cover um, within the curriculum while the other documents include a range of links to where you can kind of look to go beyond that. Um, and then if we go back to the website um, and we go to for students, again, um, it's just a matter of clicking and you'll get all of these extra resources per chapter. Um, so if I open up an example, um, no, that's for instructors. We go. here's some of the students resources um, so we've got all of these links as we've discussed to personal blogs to ted talks um, 
to just wider resources. Um, and for each, you've written a little bit about why they're relevant and why you think that students could benefit from them. Um, so it's it all builds towards that picture of helping students understand how clinical psychology and, and mental health um, and mental health care fits into the wider world. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing now, having done my, my little plug, um, and start with the Q&A. Um, so I can see that we've got a few questions already, um, but if there was anyone who was just listening and waiting till the end, um, do feel free to post in the Q&A box now um, and I'll put your questions to Paul. Um, so to start off, um, I've got a question. What do you think of mental health provision for older adults, including those suffering with dementia? Um, and how do the issues discussed so far in this webinar change when you're considering that demographic? How interesting. I, I actually, when I was a clinical psychologist, my first job was in um, um, older adults, as that discipline is now called. I, I think there is actually, I, there is also a book chapter, in one chapter talks about um, Alzheimer's disease as a, you know, one of the neurological conditions that are discussed. Um, so I think, what do I think? I mean, there are different and same issues in older adults and in um, younger people. I think, you know, there are the, the, the types of therapy that we do with the types of problems that we experience um, um, are eminently still usable. You know, there are high levels of depression, CBT, some of the third wave interventions um, one of the really interesting, we, we did a study, sorry, I'm getting slightly technical here. We did a study where we were looking to try and work on stress management with older adults. And uh, the idea was we were looking at immune function. It was quite a technical study. And uh, the idea was we would randomly allocate older adults into some sort of stress management intervention. They were caring people caring for people with um, Alzheimer's mm. and um, some sort of control. And nobody would do it, not because they thought the intervention was rubbish, but because the stress and strain of caring for somebody um, with, mm. with Alzheimer's was so great. And their fear of leaving that person in, in the house alone, well, they wouldn't be alone, they, we, we would have given them a carer, but with somebody else, um, was just too difficult for them to sort of deal with. They really didn't want to do that. So mm. you've got those traditional things like depression, that good CBT, et cetera, works. It brings along either, you know, neurological issues for the individual, or it brings along perhaps illness. It brings along caring for people. So there are challenges there that we really need to think about how to work with people. And I think some of those may be, as I've actually indicated already, CBT, some of them may be strategic. You know, how do we minimize the stress of people that are caring for a partner or a loved one that has um, either health problems or uh, neurological problems? And I don't know what the provision like is now. I suspect it's no better than when I was working and we would do the odd um, element of care. You know, people would come into hospital for a fortnight once a year, if you were lucky, you know, the mm. support for these people um, is, 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 was, and I suspect still is, pretty minimal. So I think it's that environmental issue. We need to be thinking strategically, not just giving them therapy, but thinking how can we support them in these contexts? And that comes down to money and all sorts of other things. Mm, mm. Focus on us to do that. I mean, the, the, mm. I'll finish on this because I think it's really important, but the, the stress that we put on carers um, in old age who already may be quite frail in their own health is tremendous. And they save the NHS sort of millions of pounds mm. and yet they get very little care themselves. So I shall get off my high horse now. But. No, no, I, it's good. It's um, it's good to, to hear that. Well, I mean, it's not, it's bad news, but um, it's <laughs> encouraging to hear someone speak to that. And I imagine that there'll be other people listening who have been through that experience. Um, do you think, this isn't a question of the box, I'm just interested, do you think part of the reticence to invest in mental health care for, for older adults is a sense of, well, how long do they have to live to enjoy the benefits? Um, I mean, it's not 
pleasant, but I have heard that before that maybe subconsciously there's some ageism there that they don't deserve mental health care in the same way. Is that something you've ever come across? Do you think that is playing a part in it or is that I'm mean, being paranoid? I would hesitate to say that because I haven't been there with the decision making process. But I would say the care of these people is actually much more complex in some mm -hmm. ways than caring for younger people. You know, you, you, the likelihood is you're going to have multiple morbidities. So you may be physically frail. You may have an illness that's contributing. You, if you have, if you're depressed, you may well have a long term history of that. Um, if you're caring for somebody, then you've got that added burden. You know, what about economic? You know, these people, you know, one, one of the reasons that we have a, a geriatric specialty um, amongst clinicians, uh, you know, physicians, is the complexity of care for these people. And I think the same goes for the psychological care of these people. You know, they may have neurological deficits, they may have mood issues and so on and so forth. So we certainly under resource and don't, uh, you know, provide the resources needed to deal with that complexity. Um, you know, I would hesitate to say why, but I may not disagree with you entirely. Okay, I won't, I won't force the issue. Um, so moving on to another question, and I imagine this is something that quite a lot of people will be wondering about, um, particularly given all of the headlines that we've all seen recently, you know, we're, we're heading for a crisis. Um, what do you think the long-term effects on mental health of the pandemic are likely to be? <laughs> well, I, I, I have heard rumours, I'm not going to be, uh, I, I don't know this is a fact, but I've heard rumours that the clinical psychology services uh, or the training courses are taking on more clinical psychologists into training simply to deal with that. I mean, because, you know, that the impact is going to be massive. Um, you know, I, you know, the, this, you have the problems of lockdown, you have the problems of children being you know, disengaged from other children, all those so social issues, educational issues, all those problems for younger people. Um, we've, we've done uh, some work um, looking at a particular form of intervention um, for, and, you know, part of my reading, um, what I was staggered by was the incredibly high rates of post-traumatic stress disorder in patients that have gone through ICU. Um, and if you think about one of the issues that those patients are going to have is they may have been having hallucinations while they're in ICU, shortness of breath, a classic panic issue um, they would have experienced. So we may be setting people up that have had the you know, severe COVID with PTSD, with panic disorder. And then you've got the long term COVID. Um, so you have that, um, you know, people dealing with chronic long term disease that they have no idea. Um, whether it's going to resolve or not. So you have multiple populations, you know, the general population that is having to deal with, you know, people already that are depressed or anxious. You know, there's a lot of evidence that those things have been exacerbated by lockdown. Mm -hmm. And then you've got those more specialist groups of people that are going to be experiencing uh, more, perhaps more severe problems in some ways, although those populations will be lower. So, yeah. We, we have a, a, a time bomb waiting, as I'm afraid. So you don't think that uh, clinical psychologists need to worry about being short of work in the next <laughs> um, So we've got another really interesting question. Um, with the rise in mental health awareness, do you see an increase in mental health conditions being diagnosed as a genuine increase in conditions within society or more of a reflection of people being more open to engaging with mental health dialogue? That's an interesting question. I, I think in GPs, you know, in, in the general tenor of people coming in, then I suspect um, that may be the case because people are more willing to talk about it, more willing to seek for help. But in terms of the sort of prevalence studies where we have a, an indication of the population level of clinically relevant, uh, sorry, clinically diagnosable conditions, um, then I think um, that you know, we're getting a reasonably accurate um, view. Uh, you know, one of, one of the arguments, in fact, almost counters that um, in that there was a lot of discussion some time ago that the reasons that um, there was a higher prevalence, identified prevalence of mental health issues among women was because they were more likely to come into, into the 
um, general health services were a lot more willing to talk about mental health problems and so on and so forth, whereas the men will be stoic and heroic and, um, you know, sort of not come to the uh, attention of the medical services and so forth. Um, but that has been completely discounted by the, you know, detailed epidemiological work that's been done that has shown quite clearly that it is not a reporting issue, but there are genuinely higher levels of diagnosable disorders in particular groups. So I suspect to answer the question, I think the number of people presenting with problems may be increasing and therefore impacting on healthcare services. But if you want the sort of scientific overview of the prevalence, then I think that's relatively independent of that because um, people are, you know, probably diagnosed through those processes. Mm -hmm. Having said that, uh, Oh, can I? Uh, please, please do. Or I'm slightly aware of time as well. I, uh, when I first started, when I did my what was then a master's degree in clinical psychology, which is showing my age, I worked with people with irritable bowel syndrome, believe it or not. That was one of the first publications of it. I was Mr. Irritable Bowel at one time. <laughs> And, and I presume that's how you still like to be referred to. What better accolade could you have? But I remember <laughs> what one of the, at, at the end of it all, one of the um, people in my study came up to me and um, they all had a very medical model of their problems when they came to see me. And by the time I had finished with them, although I wasn't, I wasn't pushing them towards a psychological model, they actually developed a much more psychological model. And I remember one guy came up to me and said, look, Paul, you know, I really feel a lot better having gone through the sort of stuff that you've done. But if you look at my measures, you'll probably think I've got worse because I'm now calling everything psychological, whereas before I called everything medical. So it may be that, you know, people are also beginning to change their understandings of mental health, as well as being more willing to talk about it. And mm. sometimes experiences are now being sort of, you know, more labeled as mental health rather than physical health. You know, there's mm. somatic disorders going on at the moment. Um, in England, there's a whole trunk of treatment for people with those issues. So, you know, there's a lot of complex that may be leading to, you know, an apparent high preval higher prevalence of these things. Mm -hmm. Um, so that leads quite neatly into the next question about that, the overlap between mental and physical health. Um, so Jonathan notes, um, he notes that you're also a health psychologist and he asks, were there any studies or similar studies looking at stress and the body's antibody response to the vaccine? Is that something you've come across? Strange you should mention that because we've actually done one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there are some and um, the, the one I was involved in, um, if, if you're a health psychologist, I'm sure this will be a familiar name to you. There's, uh, it was led by uh, Kavita Vedhara, Kavedhara. And um, what we did was to, this, this study I was telling you about in Bristol, we did manage to just about get enough people. And we had um, three groups. We had a group of, if you like, non-carer older adults. We had a group of carer adults and we had a group of carer adults that we gave some sort of stress management, helping them to manage the person they were caring for, deal with their own stress. And at the end of all that, they got the flu vaccine. And what we were able to do was to measure the um, percentage of people that had a sufficient immune response, essentially to deal with the, the real um, flu virus if they were to encounter it. And the, the results were quite scary, I have to say. Uh, this is long-term memory, but something like only 10% of the um, stressed carers who did not receive our intervention actually mounted a sufficient um, immunological response to the vaccine to indicate that they would be able to deal with a real flu. Mm. Something like only 20% of the non-carers, maybe slightly more, 25% of the non-carers um, had a good vaccine response. And that uh, something like 50% that received the stress intervention actually had a an immune response indicative of blah, 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 blah. So yeah, I, I, you know, viruses, I'm not gonna claim to be a virologist clearly, but certainly we found a massive and quite scary um, impact of stress on uh, and day-to-day -day stress, not even people that were, um, you know, receiving a, a, a diagnostic levels of stress 
um, mm. on their immune response. Mm -hmm. But don't forget, giraffes also have a compromised immune system as well. So it may be less so in adults, but it may be exaggerated in, in older folks. And I think that speaks again to a lot of what you're focused on in the book, which is the importance of taking that holistic view of, of mental health care. Um, because obviously, if stress can have that powerful impact on you getting a vaccine response effectively, think how powerful it is in all other areas of our lives. Um, I think we may have to stop there. I think we're three minutes um, on, although we do have some great other questions. Um, so maybe afterwards we can look at um, putting those to you. We could perhaps do a video or something like that um, as a follow-up. So sorry that we're not gonna get to those. Um, I wanted to just thank you so much for your time today. It's been a real pleasure and really enlightening. Um, and I also wanted to do very quickly, um, so many people work on putting a book together, obviously, mainly the author, um, but because we have a few of the people who worked on it on the line, um, I wanted to say thank you um, to my colleagues, Zoe Osman and Beth Summers, who did a lot of the proofreading and building the website, um, and to Hannah Churchill, who I think joined today, who did some of the proofreading as well, um, and my colleague, Bryony, who has been involved in all of the marketing. Um, so I think- you have we proofreaders. Sorry, they were magnificent, the proofreaders. If it's just <laughs> what I saw, then wow, yeah, that was impressive. Maybe it's a different thing, I don't know. But, uh, no, no, yeah, they do. They deserve a lot of praise, so thank you, guys. Wow, yeah, excellent. And we've just got a few thanks for you coming up in the chat box, Paul. Um, and on a final note, I would say the book is published today. Um, so you can buy a copy on our website um, and also look at all of the additional resources that we have. Um, and if you would like, um, if you're an instructor and you're looking at using it on your course, do get in touch because we can give you a complimentary copy. Thank you so much, Clara. I just wanted to add my thanks as well to Clara for putting the questions and Paul for answering them in such detail and with such good humour. And thank you both for all of the work that you've put into this wonderful book. Um, I've put on the screen here details just of how you can stay in touch with us if you'd like to. Um, there's my email address if you've got any questions, um, our social media links. And then if you would like to get hold of the book um, as a lecturer, we offer a sample copy service. So you can go to our website and the fill in the short request form there. Um, if you're a student, we're offering you a discount code. So if you'd like to get hold of a copy, um, there's a 20% discount if you want to buy one through our website. So we'd be uh, delighted to hear from you. Um, we will be sharing the recording of this event over the next couple of days. Um, do pass it on to anyone who wasn't able to attend today. Um, and thank you once again, everyone who was able to attend. We've really um, been grateful to you for giving up your time this afternoon. Thanks once again, Thanks everybody. everyone. We shall finish Thanks. there. I think. Enjoy your afternoon. <laughs>